of Health, Mental Health, and Education Committee. It is 9.03, and we're in City Hall, room 1010. We do not yet have a quorum, but I am joined by Councilmember Mitchell Farrell. And um, I'd like to remind anyone who has speaker cards to fill out a card and please bring it up to the front. Okay, great. Um, even though we don't have quorum, I'd like to open up for public comment. Could, if I could have Antonio Ramirez come up. And you signed up for two, five, six, and public comment. I want to give you four minutes for all. Thank you, sir, very much. I appreciate that. Thank you again, um, Councilman Brew. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, uh, agenda number two, let's shut down the Department of Disability. It isn't working, they don't help you, and they, they keep you holding on for over years. I've uh, asked um, Adriana for the longest time for assistance and Mr. Simon for the longest time of assistance. I realize that I am blackballed by the city, so I'm not going to get any help with the Department of Disability. Um, so I give up. I, Ms. Dr. Robert Bittant is a lovely man, but you know what? You can be lovely and still not do your job. So shut down the Department of Disability. It is non-functional and non-responsive. I've given up on them. Um, number five, on the health insurance and the aging, yes, every minute we age. We age every minute. We're all gonna get older and I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I'm excited. So I'm not vain that way, although I am vain. I like growing old and graceful. I like taking care of myself, and I pack myself on with vitamins. So God bless America and the vitamins. And having said that, um, public comments. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm so pissed off this morning. As of yesterday, about uh, when I left the city hall yesterday, about 7 o'clock, the, um, the women's bathroom at the Music Center Grand Park female's bathroom and men's bathroom was shut down. Again, the wetbacks and the gangbangers and blacks have been vandalizing the bathrooms. This happens all the time. There's always fights between the blacks and Latinos and some white trash junkies and crackheads, but it's mostly Latinos and blacks that always stir up trouble or both of them. And so I, we had to use block, that's in block number four bathroom, which is across the street from the city hall. We had to use the bathroom upstairs, up in block number one by Starbucks. Now they're saying that the bathrooms up there are also um, non-functional. Can you stick so, to the topic at hand? Yes, uh, thank you. Mental health, ladies and gentlemen, there are a few homeless people that are not mentally ill. We have, I am homeless by design, but I am not mentally ill. I'm angry because no one is doing anything to protect the segment of population that is homeless, that are being gang struck by politicals. No one is helping us. Therefore, I am not a mental, I am not a drug addict, I don't drink, I don't smoke, and I don't do any of that. I stand my ground. And again, a few of us who are homeless are not mentals, but a large segment of your wetbacks and your gangbangers and your uh, violent predators are mentals, and they should be be kept away. They should be, the blacks should be sent to Guantanamo Bay and the wetbacks and the gangbangers should be taken out because they are private and public nuisance. They should be deported. Again, you've got a lot of homeless, mentally ill and violent predators who are mixed in with good people who are just tourists or visitors or guests and or homeless good people and you are having them attack us on a daily basis. This is non-stop. Please, ladies and gentlemen, let's start protecting the legal law abiding citizen and stop rewarding these wetbacks and gangbangers and black brawlers and white trash junkies and crackheads. No more rewarding them. Start rewarding those who stand up to fight the good fight and start again giving hope to those of us who stand up as whistleblowers, do not shut us up, do not attack us, do not violate us, but let us stand up together, unite together like the Donald Trumps, and help fortify America, restore America, bring back values, morals, dignity, compassion, um, understanding, but no violence, no rage, no attacks, and no bullying. That's got to stop. And anybody who starts attacking me, bullying me, I will stand up and fight them. I don't care if they're black or brown or whomever. I will take them on. I will not be trampled on. I didn't bust my ass to learn English so I can have some jackass attack me or violate me. And I'm not above the law and nor are the blacks nor are the browns. God bless America and Donald Trump. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ramirez. Um, can we now have Herman? And Herman, you sign up for, I believe, all items and public comment. I'll give you five minutes. Thank you. Thank you for the accommodations. Um, so much anger on an early morning. Just got back from Sacramento, matter of fact. Speak with, for the record, Mr. Mark Leno, our senator. 
And he brought up a very important bill regarding uh, the physical effect of appropriations of $6.2 million from Prop 63 to authorize the general phone to loan $1 million to provide the insurance of $2 billion in bonds by the treasurer and the secured of Prop 63 revenue. Similar to item number five in health insurance counseling and advocacy program. And then I go into the Disabled Access Appeals Commission, Mr. O'Farrell. People with AIDS can be in the same situation other people are in. They're being discriminated because they have AIDS. They don't have a right to speak, they're censored. Then as Miss uh, Young Lady, but not by name, not to put her under the train wreck here, choo choo, she brought out some very good points. There's nothing wrong with her mental health. What's wrong with society's mental health on social issues to protect us in our communities? Stakeholders, aren't we all in the same boat? Noah's Ark, save the world, Mr. O'Farrell, save the world. Now, regarding the Disabled Access Appeals Commission, the lady's right on number three. There's no communication. How many times have I asked the poverty pimps there that I'm looking for a relocation for, for rent? I'm looking for housing. But you sent me to Sacramento to bitch, 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 which I did yesterday to our senator, Mr. Mark Leno. Matter of fact, it was an interesting committee budget on AB 1618 and 1622. As I took to the floor on public comment, to remind you, my intelligence poured into the inability of the city of Los Angeles to help people who are homeless. Isn't that pretty sad? I talked about that fucking fool, Mr. What's that fool's name, by the way? Oh, I remember now. Hey, Weezar. Yeah, I talked about Weezar at Sacramento with Mr. Mark Lennon and the committee there. So you see, we we're talking about 10 million of a budget appropriation previously made for California emergency solutions and grant programs and instead to direct all expansion of existing homeless to the use exploration. No, pour it out to people who are asking you for help. You heard the lady this morning, she's asking you for help. I need help. My doctors say I'm fine. Even Mr. B, I have him in the bag, he said, I'm okay, Herman. Just keep rattling them up. They'll eventually give in to your mental health. Yeah. But see, we all go through 5150. Look at O'Farrell's 5150. Look at mine. Look at Antonia's. Look what you did to Wayne Spindler. 422APC. Was he crazy because he filled out a, a public comment card? Simply asking for access and appeals for people who need help? That's all Mr. Spindler does on behalf of the public. But no, you took the poor attorney from Encino because of a public card that you found offensive, inflammatory. But no, it was the racist Herb Weston Jr. who attacked, who, again, he attacked by his anger. He was angry. Did you read the paper? He was angry. See, my expressions at City Hall is not anger. It's frustration, ladies Chairman, and gentlemen. Can you focus on uh, topics at hand? So going into the items like well, item six, Los Angeles Department of Aging report to a relevant request to approve and accept $13 million on older American acts. Do you really respect older Americans? Look how many older Americans are homeless today. Please, 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 Mr. O'Farrell, because we don't have a quorum because Felipe Fuentes, the chipmunk, Joe Busquiano, and M Mitchell Englander, the big ears who lost for county board supervisor seat, are not in their seat to really engage with the public's interests. This is about public interest. Call Sacramento and ask him what Mr. Herman, what the hell were you doing up there, Mr. Herman, in Sacramento yesterday? Fuck you. Thank you, Mr. Herman. Um, 
If we could actually, uh, Councilman Buscaino is on his way, and I'm sure he'll be here in a minute. So if we could take items two and three together, Mr. Um, CLA, can you read them into the agenda? Item number two is a communication from the mayor relative to the reappointment of Dr. Robert Batante to the Commission on Disability for the term ending June 30th, 2021. Item number three is a communication from the Mayor and City Ethics Commission relative to the reappointment of Dr. Cheryl Revkin to the Disabled Access Appeals Commission for the term ending June 30th, 2021. Thank you, um, Mr. CLA. Um, these are the reappointments from, from the Mayor's office for the two commissioners. Uh, as mentioned, could I have Dr. Robert Bitonte and Dr. Cheryl Revkin come on up? Is Dr. Robert, he's not. oh, he's not here yet? Okay. So Dr. Cheryl Refkin, how are you? Good morning. Fine. Uh, thank thank you. you so much for coming. Thank and you uh, for having me. if you could kind of introduce yourself to us. I'm Dr. Cheryl Refkin. I uh, was appointed to the commission, I guess it was a year ago. And uh, I've been uh, serving whenever we were called. We've only had, um, I think, three or four sessions the whole year but I was there for each one of them. And um, I feel like the commission's been very good. We've been w working hard. We worked hard on those uh, issues and they were very diverse. Um, I feel like um, really applied myself and uh, we made good decisions. Great, no, disabled access appeal, it's very important. Um, so in your one year, so is there something that, any observations you've made or anything you wanna change or, um, no, I don't think so. Uh, we, uh, the woman who kind of counseled us apparently retired, but she spent a lot of time with us on those first three meetings, and I think we felt really competent to make good decisions, and I think it was good. The only thing was I think there was a big fire downtown, and uh, the um, building had limited access, so I heard that the that maybe they moved, moved the offices to a different location. I'm not sure. I was never notified about that, though. Great. Um, Mr. O'Farrell, do you have any questions? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just that uh, Dr. Refkin, I've known for 14 years, <laughs> a resident of the 13th District, and has always been so helpful um, in any endeavor that you have participated in, whether it was the Salt Lake Chamber of Commerce or your volunteerism in the community. And so it's great to have an opportunity to thank you for stepping up again. Oh, thank you so much. And can you continue to do so? I will. And, and that building that you mentioned, was that, was that where the Office of Disability was over on FIG? Yeah, right. FIG and 2nd. And, right. um, and you're, you're not sure where they the are? The offices are point. now, right. Okay. Like if we're called to a meeting. I'm... Okay, well, we'll have to figure that out. I, I, I believe, that, I thought they moved back. Oh, they did? I, I thought so. I, th I thought the project was, okay. was done. That'd be good. <laughs> don't quote me on that, but we'll make sure... Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that, that caused a disarray for, for a long right. time. But anyway, thank you for, okay. for your service. And as far as initiatives, uh, what, what kind of initiatives is the Appeals Commission working on or focusing on? Uh, well, like I said, we had a variety of cases that came up. One was the AMC theater renovation, and they wanted a, a variance on uh, their a access uh, to have the seats for disabled people being a little bit closer to the screen than was actually legal. But then there was a case um, of a low-income housing unit, and the um, owner of the building wanted to eliminate one of the disabled uh, apartments mm -hmm. there uh, because he said um, he could have more low-income units but less for the disabled. and we were not inclined to kind of grant that because we felt that we're there to protect disabled people and we need more units, not less units. And um, there was, a, oh, I don't know, a case in a parking lot where the, they were renovating a hotel and the parking lot, um, the disabled spaces for parking lot people, uh, people, who, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. the spaces for people who were disabled um, if they got out of the car, it wouldn't be safe for them to go behind the vehicle to actually get access to the building. And so we required that they have an aide there whenever they are open uh, who would accompany a disabled person. And they accommodated to that. So it was, um, I, felt like, I felt like it was good work, <laughs> really. Great. Well, thanks for looking out. Mm -hmm. for okay, thanks. Community. Thanks Thank for you. your work, too. 
Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Revkin. Uh, this is a volunteer board, and we really appreciate your service to the City of LA. Um, we're going to hold this so we could have, once we have quorum, we'll vote on uh, both items two and three. If we could move now to back to item number one. Mr. CLA, can you read that in? Item number one is a discussion with School Board President Steve Zimmer relative to the public education collaboration between the City Council and the Los Angeles Unified School District Board. Thank you very much, and I am very excited to have our very good friend and partner, uh, LAUSD Board President Mr. Steve Zimmer. Um, he's been a terrific partner. Um, uh, Mr. Herman, no, no uh, clapping, please, if you could um, not interrupt. Thank you. Um, so, and Mr. Zimmer, thank you so much. You've been a great partner to the City of LA. We've worked on already in our, in our short time several initiatives, and we look forward to continue working. And this is, is not going to be your only time. We expect you to come again and again and again. And, um, and please, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it's an honor to be here uh, on behalf of uh, uh, the Superintendent, uh, Ms. King, and uh, my colleagues on the board. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Councilman Rood, chair of the committee, um, for not only for inviting me, but literally since you've taken office, uh, reaching out to us, um, really uh, fostering this partnership uh, between, a seamless partnership between the city and, and the school district. Um, and I'd also, it's a great honor to be um, here at the committee um, and, and just to uh, use this as an opportunity to accelerate uh, the relationship. And I'm very impressed with what you're doing here as chair of this committee and uh, really uh, being a lot more proactive. A lot of times we're reactive in our relationships and this is an opportunity for us to, um, to really be proactive and really uh, have that working relationship that's not only uh, we call when things go wrong or there's a crisis or we have to um, mitigate a situation for our constituents, but what are we really doing uh, to make sure that all the resources of the city of Los Angeles, all the resources of our school district are aligned together to get to better for our, our kids and, and their families. And, and the chair has singularly understood that mission. I'm very appreciative of your work and very honored to be here. I'd also like to say that it's an honor to uh, speak in front of my longtime friend, Councilman O'Farrell. Uh, Councilman O'Farrell and I have walked many of the neighborhoods uh, of the 13th Council District well before, but back when we were both civilians, and, uh, and just trying to help families uh, in crisis, help neighborhoods where uh, services had been uh, depleted for years, where resources had not once flowed, uh, both in your work as a uh, as a as a dedicated staffer and and, and field organizer, and now as a council member, uh, we've really changed lives, and uh, you've been a great part of that. And it's been great to work side by side. And it's still kind of strange that we like put on these suits and ties and uh, and don't have our walking shoes. But um, it's an honor to to be speaking at, in front of you and at this committee. I'd like to introduce uh, my my intern, my fellow um, uh, Earl Perk, uh, Earl uh, Turner the uh, Third. Reigns from uh, New Orleans, Louisiana, been out here in Los Angeles the last three years uh, teaching, and I'm very honored to have Earl uh, working with me uh, in, the, uh, in the board office this summer. He's been a great asset, and I hope uh, welcome to, to Earl as well. Um, let me, uh, as we start this presentation, let, let me just start off by, by saying two things. Number one is this is the first time that I've actually come in front of any council committee uh, where I have more than the allotted one or two minutes of uh, public <laughs> speaking time. And it won't so, be the last. Yeah, so, but, no, thank you. And I'll, I'll try not to, to, to abuse that. But uh, th this is the first time, actually, since December 15th that I've actually had a chance to come in a formal capacity. And I, I just want to say, on behalf of all of 
the students and the families, uh, the teachers and the school employees of LA Unified School District. What happened on December 15th when we needed in crisis to shut down all of our schools for the day uh, to ensure that all of our children were safe was unprecedented. Uh, honestly, it was a, a very, very difficult moment for the families of uh, our city and of, of this district. And I just want to, in, in my official capacity, come and say thank you to the city of Los Angeles. We have over 700,000 children that were affected on that day. By 10 o'clock in the morning, there were only three families that had, not been, that had not been reunited. Think about that for a second. Across the entire city and region, 700,000 children, families, all affected by this closure. By 10 o'clock, only three children had not been reunited with their parents, with their family members. That took every bit of resource, not only from the school district, but also from the city. And if you could, Mr. Chair, on my behalf, on behalf of the superintendent, just extend out a thank you to the uh, LA City family, Park and Rec, Library, everybody, it was all hands on deck. Kids had a place to go. No one was unsafe on a day that we could not guarantee their safety. It was a wonderful day uh, to be an Angelino. Uh, a hard day to be, um, to be at the Board of Education. But a, uh, good morning, Councilman. Uh, but a great day to be an Angelino. And there was, on that day, there was no LAUSD family, city family, county family. We were all one family. And if you could just extend my thanks uh, to the LA City family for everything that they did that day. No one asked to be thanked. Nobody, nobody asked any questions. It was just all hands on deck. And uh, it was a great day to be part of, part of the Los Angeles family. So I want to come and talk today, I want to talk to you a little bit about where we are, where we're going, and where I see uh, the potential partnerships. I want to start by talking about uh, what happened just a week ago today, literally a week ago, right at this time. Uh, our, our colleagues, your colleagues, um, Marquise Harris-Dawson and uh, Jose Wisar came over to uh, the Blue Room at LAUSD um, to celebrate the first class, the class of 2016 is the first class to have graduated meeting the full A through G requirements. And uh, uh, Councilman Huisar was president of the Board of Education um, in 2005 when the A through G resolution was passed. And Marquise Harris Dawson was uh, the president and CEO of Community Coalition, the main group that advocated for the A through Gs. Now, to back up a little bit and, and explain why this is so, so significant. In affluent school districts um, across the state and across this nation, uh, the question of whether or not all kids will have access to a college preparatory curriculum, uh, it's not a question, it's an assumption. Nobody, uh, nobody asks, nobody um, raises issues about children in affluent communities having access to uh, a college preparatory curriculum. But here in Los Angeles and in urban centers uh, uh, across the country, uh, this was a pitched battle just to allow all children to be able to take college preparatory classes. And, and your colleague, uh, the councilman, um, uh, both at the activist level, Mr. Harris Dawson, and at the leadership level at the time uh, with uh, then board president, now councilman Wissar, took bold and courageous steps that should not have needed to be bold and courageous, but they were. And 11 years later, the first class graduated this spring having passed the full A through Gs. Now, the critics, the LA Times and others, predicted catastrophe. These kids will never be able to rise to that level. 
literally was said in the pages, the editorial pages of the newspaper. What Councilman Wizar and Councilman Harris Dawson knew, and I myself knew as a, as a, as a teacher um, at the time, as a counselor at the time, what, uh, what Mitchell Farrell knew from working in the community, what the former councilman, now mayor, knew was that our kids could do amazing things if we just raised the expectation and provided the resources. So counter to the predictions of disaster, um, there was, we actually have completed this 2016 year with what we believe will be the highest graduation rate in the history of LA Unified School District. With every student, every student, not some kids, all kids, having passed the full A through G. And so when you see the, the, the first chart that I've brought to you, so you see where we were, um, you see where we were at the end of the fall of 2015. And now you see, um, you see the beginning of w how we were able to provide these supports, provide these resources, and actually move that grid up step by step, all hands on deck, all along the way. If you can go ahead and move to the, or if, uh, if you can do the, thank you. Um, and so you'll see that we have this upward trajectory process, um, progress in, uh, with both the A through Gs, with everything that we are, that we are seeing. We still have a lot of work to do. The areas where passage rates are not in the high 80s or the low 90s are the areas where we have the highest concentration of poverty. We know this. It's not, it's, it's not a secret um, that where we have schools that are still struggling, we know now, in, as we've seen how we can move the bar and move the percentages, that when we put the right types of resources and supports around our students, they will achieve. Not everybody needs the same level of support. When uh, this is very true that the governor recognized in the local control funding formula, when you are an English learner, when you are living in situations of um, economic and racial segregation, when you are living in situations of extreme poverty, when you are part of the foster system, you do need extra supports. But it doesn't mean, as the assumptions were in the past, that you can't achieve. It just means that we, instead of spreading all of our resources equitably, I mean equally, we have to use that equity equation and make sure that we are resourcing where the need is, is the greatest. Why don't you hit the next side there, Earl. Okay. So we, are, we have also looked at um, all of our different programs um, through this equity lens. So the next slide that Earl has, has pulled up here, it talks about magnet programs. And magnet programs are some of the most popular programs in the district. It's been a struggle to help us realize that we need to invest more resources. So, and you see it, and, and we'll make sure that, that all the committee members and, and all the, the guests have a copy of, of, this, uh, of this PowerPoint. Um, uh, but you can see that we have several different models. We have full magnet models. Um, we've been able to open um, in the 13th Council District. Um, uh, King and Irving as, as full magnets. And my school's listed up there, Bravo Medical. There you go. There you go. That, that's, uh, and, and these are schools that are uh, really just excel. And we have had um, challenges, to be very frank, in making sure that um, uh, we have an equitable distribution of magnet programs throughout the district. That's something that we're working on according to the equity index. Well, why don't you bring us up to the next slide. So you can see as magnet programs are expanding, um, we are looking at, and you look at the enrollment there, um, we're growing from 198 programs 
in. Mr. President, I'm sorry, on the magnets, are you focused on middle school, elementary, both high school, K through 12? All K through, K through 12. K through 12. K through 12. We am building pipelines. So let's say if a family enters a family enters in kindergarten and they're entering a STEM magnet. Um, and uh, we, it used to be, you could have a great elementary magnet, and then where do you go? Right, so you yeah, it, finding feeder schools. Right. right, so what we're trying to do is create that instructional pipeline. And so if you make a choice, um, a magnet choice in kindergarten, that's something that we can assure through 12th grade graduation. So you'll see, and a lot of this, um, as you look at the growing seats, there, again, we're looking through two lenses. Number one, the equity lens. Are we making sure that communities where you have the highest concentration of poverty have the most access to the, these resources? And we're looking at that pipeline that Councilman Buscaino spoke about. If you choose it in kindergarten, it's a choice you can make all the way through 12th grade. Go ahead, Earl. Let's go to the next slide. So we also believe that access to arts education can't be a privilege for the affluent and the lucky. If you're affluent you have, and, and you're into the arts, there are ways that your family can, can support you and, and, and access after school programs. If you're lucky, if you happen to live in a high poverty community where you have a principal or a teacher who has great connections to the art industry, you know, the, the, the entertainment industry, you can have a rock star um, arts program. What we have to make sure is that it is that arts education is a right for every child in LAUSD. So we created the Arts Equity Index, which basically does a formula, it's an algorithm. To, so we're looking at issues of equity, we're looking at issues of um, uh, poverty and access, but we're also looking at the same, with the same thing as the Magnet Program. If you start an instrumental program in, in elementary school, you should know that there's going, that there's going to be an orchestra in high school um, because nothing would drive our orchestra or band or other uh, folks crazy in that they come into a high school, but there's no elementary and middle school pipeline. So we created this index to make sure that we are, we're distributing resources based on this. And Earl will go to the next slide and show us how we're, how we're doing. Um, I want to make sure we have some time for questions. So oh, okay. To... Cool. Let, let me roll, let me roll through much much quicker then. Okay. Well, why don't we go to the uh, why don't we go to the next slide here? Okay. So uh, another new program that is uh, that is coming in in literally all the all of your districts are dual immersion programs. Very very popular programs. Um, uh, students come in. Uh, you, we try to have a 50-50 split between native language speakers of, of the primary language and um, uh, English, uh, English only speakers. And you can see in our local districts we have Spanish language dual immersion programs, Korean, Mandarin, Armenian. Um, we are looking, we're starting our first Arabic program and we're looking at starting our first Farsi program. Um, uh, and, and Hebrew program in the, in the coming years. We also started our first... What's that? These go, again, they start in elementary school all the way K through 12, okay? So we have our first students now. We have our first students now in eighth grade. So we're, we, our first cohort is now in eighth grade, and now we have the, the high school program starting next year. Earl, go ahead to the next slide. Um, link Learning. This is a really, really important program. Uh, all of you have linked learning academies in your districts. Um, these are high school. It's the old Perkins vocational program with a very, very modern twist. Um, it's completely curricularly embedded, A through G aligned um, career and technical education where we have academies uh, and, and, and we align them with whether it's the healthcare industry, the performing, you know, our entertainment industry, our construction trades, Whatever it is, these are aligned. Students do job shadowing. You will probably have interns in your office before you know it. Let's go to the next slide. Um, okay, here are the, some of the different, and again, you'll, you'll get this. Here are some of the different, um, uh, and you'll see that while some of them are traditional um, trades, some of them are very, very new. Um, but we still need that career instructional pipeline. 
Go ahead, Earl. Okay, here's some of the challenges that we're facing right now, and, and you all know this, um, but it's important for me to, to let you know. We, we are chronically underfunded in terms of public education in the state of California. Even with the LCFF, we are 44th in the nation in terms of per pupil funding. That shouldn't be okay with any of us. Um, we have a major federal funding issue as it relates to the, the funding of special education, the Individuals with Disability Education Act. I'm going to Washington, D.C. later today. I'll be meeting, uh, I, I will be meeting with Democratic leadership in preparation for what we hope will be a successful November. I don't want there to be a moment that lapses without folks understanding that the underfunding of special education is the single most important public education funding issue in the nation. We'll go through with our other challenges that you know about, declining enrollment, we have increasing costs, they're no different than the, than the challenges that you're facing at the city level. Go ahead, Earl, to the next slide. Um, this is the slide that I wanted to get to, and I'll wrap up here. These are what we believe are some of our opportunities to work together as advocates. And again, you'll get a copy of, um, of, uh, uh, of this packet. Um, special education funding, I talked about um, the federal issue, the underfunding, just to give you a sense. We start every year with a structural deficit of $320 million because of the federal underfunding of special education. That's how our district starts every year, okay? But there is also a state funding issue that we're gonna need everybody's help on. Unlike the LCFF, where the governor has realized that families living in high concentrations of poverty, um, uh, youth in the foster system, English language learners need a differentiated level of support, special education funding is not distributed that way. And it's still kind of this even keel at the state, this, this even funding level that greatly disservices and underfunds LAUSD in terms of the state distribution level. We'll need um, your help on that. After school programs, our great partner, Eric Gernes, in the, in the audience today, we fought very hard in Sacramento to try and get a small increase in after school funding. I don't need to tell any of the committee members, any of the council members, how important our relationship is with LA's Best, with Beyond the Bell. These are, and all of you have been incredibly supportive. Gerna and his team do amazing things. After, just incredible things after school, but the state did not support us. School does not end at 3.30. Lives of families do not stop at 3.30. We have working families in the city who cannot, you know, be there at 3.30 all the time to pick up their kids. After school programs are public education programs. We need to work together to get that funded. Next, early education. All of us know this. The research is very, very clear. The most important gap the most important gap affecting kids living in poverty is not the so-called achievement gap. It is the school readiness gap. It is what, hap what are the differences between a child who is affluent and a child who is living in a high concentration of poverty. What are the differences that they come into kindergarten with, their preparation levels? Not because their families don't care, but because it's materially different it's materially different if your mom and your dad are working two jobs and cannot spend that all that time with you between zero and five. It's materially different. And we can change this. We know we can change this. With a small level of investment, we can provide high quality early education to every child living in poverty if we have that commitment at the state level. Two last ones, safe passages. We've worked, we've all worked together on it. We can increase our partnership there. And the last one, um, I'll just say two incredibly exciting initiatives. One uh, started right here by, by your chair. Uh, he and I have both uh, introduced in our, in our respective bodies um, parallel uh, legislation to start college savings accounts. Um, for all kids living in poverty in um, the Los Angeles area. Uh, and this is very exciting because college persistence is not, college persistence is not a question of effort. It's not a question of potential. 
it's oftentimes a question of resources. And the last thing I, I will say is that um, the initiative uh, of, of the mayor and the council to have that first year of community college paid for free, um, you know, it, it harkens back to, you know, the only way my family, um, my parents came out of poverty, the first, they were of course the first in their uh, entire family to go to college. It was the GI Bill for my dad and it was the City College of New York for my mother. This was, and I would not be here today if it were not for those programs. And so the dreams of our kids today are no different than the dreams of our own parents and our own grandparents. And what we're doing in terms of working together uh, really is about fulfilling the American dream through our partnership. Last slide is my favorite slide. Um, uh, yeah, there. Well, we could talk about joint. No, not, that joint use is definitely not my favorite slide. <laughs> this is my. This is. This is. This is my favorite slide. Um, that's the old bridge. The bridge ain't there anymore. But um, our kids are certainly moving towards that grad graduation stage. Thank you for the opportunity to present to you. I'm happy to answer. Thank you, Mr. Questions. Zimmer. And we have about 10 minutes for questions, so I'm just going to get right into it. But actually, we have um, Eric Kerna here, CEO of LA's Best. If you want to come and join us, come on, Eric, man. come on up. And, um, and, and thank you so much. Um, everything we talked about, it's because we've been working together. Even that incident on December 15th, it's because of the, all the preparation we've done together in advance and collaboration. And it's exactly what we're doing here today where uh, it's not just for emergency uh, um, disaster preparedness, but it's future projects like the savings account, which I'm very excited about, and so is all my colleagues. But I'm just going to get right to it. Um, Joint use, actually, that's what a great let's slide. Let's go back to the joint use slide. Yeah, yeah, let's, let's, let's go back, Earl. Thank um, you. That, yeah. That's been discussed on several <laughs> committees throughout yeah. city council. So, um, and I just wanted to make sure, uh, you know, your thoughts on LAUSD being interested on a joint use agreement yeah. um, and opening up a lot of our schools. Yeah. Um, um, especially, uh, but even if we don't, but if we get the parcel, parks parcel yeah. tax passed in November, yeah. um, your interest in, if you could... Quickly. Thank you for, for giving me the opportunity to talk about November in 15 seconds. That parcel tax is, is almost as important as the, the number one thing, which is getting Prop 30 extended. But these two things together will be game changers for our students. Um, look, we, I, I, I glossed over it because I was so excited about the picture. But joint use, but joint use is, I mean, this is, this is such an opportunity for us. No, I, I mean, just, if you think about the image, we didn't have it in the, in the slide, but let's just, let, let's just break open those locks. Yeah. Let's, let's unlock the gate. Correct. We have park, we, we, have, we, we have the equipment, we have, we have the facilities, we want them open. Every school in every neighborhood should be open into the evening and on every weekend. It can be done. We have models for doing it. It costs some money, but it is, the, it is a key investment. Great. That's refreshing to hear. I mean, that's um, all we talk about in various committees, yep. um, and um, and we're so happy that you're in complete let's, agreement. Let, with let, us. Let's let, let's we. I'm sure that our force of collective will can overpower the lawyers. And let me ask you about <laughs> after <laughs> and the bureaucracy. And um, regarding after school programs, I know uh, it's been we did not get that increase this year, and and you you guys are expecting some cuts. But what can the city do to assist the school district in enhancing or embracing or expanding? After school programs. And well, let, one of you. yeah, I'll, I'll turn it over to 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 my colleague. I think it's just a, a an absolute awareness that we have to have all over over the city that school just it school doesn't end at three thirty, and our families work into the evening. But even beyond that, what we are seeing through robotics programs and 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 Eric could talk about this through through STEM programs through athletic programs. This is. These are the, the game changers for kids. The connectedness for kids doesn't always happen during, during the school day. We, are, we look at after school programs at no differently than we look through, than we look at the, 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 the formal school day. But I'll turn it over to my friend and colleague, Mr. Gurna. Thank you. Um, thanks for inviting me up here. Uh, well, Councilmember Root, to directly answer your question, what can the city do? One thing the city can do is, is what it already does, but more, which is fund after-school programs. Um, LA's Best is partially funded by the city of LA. It was founded by Mayor Bradley, and for the first several years, the, the city funding was the core funding. Um, it was a different time. That was through CRA and later CDD. Um, but we're still in um, you know, general city purposes funding, but we've been 
it declined quite quite a bit over the years, and it's been it was stabilized a couple years ago, so we've been flat for the last couple years, um, and that's that's one very direct way that the city can can support LA's best. And you know, I, I had sort of assumed that it was too late to get any additional help this year, but given that we are looking at cutting slots um, uh, across the city based on our, our uh, you know not getting the the state increase. Um, you know, if the, if the city wants to jump in and save the day on that, we would be most grateful, and so would the kids and families. The state is also looking at um, uh, doing cuts across the state just to uh, um, allow the programs that do exist to survive. Um, one other thing that we're uh, looking at right now uh, with the legislature, there's a bill which includes um, cuts to slots, unfortunately, and also uh, removal of the requirement that we stay open until 6 p.m., um, which is actually, the, we, we strongly support that. Um, we, uh, we can find substantial cost savings by closing a little earlier with, it's still some impact on kids and families, without a doubt, but it's dispersed equally across the city. We can have some flexibility to stay open for those parents who really do need us, for those few kids. We, will, we always stay open and well into the night sometimes when parents have problems and are late. Um, but that bill is currently going before committee, and, and we do need support um, to get that through. And that's sponsored by Jim Cooper, um, who sponsored the original legislation for the increase. I definitely with the state, we'll, we'll be working with you. And um, at the city, yes, budget cycle closed, but we'll work with my colleagues on the committee to see what we could do and get back. But I want to open up for questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chairman Rue. Great job, great leadership on this. And um, uh, it, interesting throughout your whole uh, presentation, Mr. Zimmer, I was just thinking about, really it all adds up to the opportunity gap that mm -hmm. exists in our city across our neighborhoods, especially the traditionally underserved neighborhoods. It's all about opportunity that comes along with everything you talked mm -hmm. about. Uh, and so uh, I think we're all terribly interested in working with LUSD School Board in increasing the levels of opportunity that our neighborhoods so desperately need. And I want to commend you, you. and your colleagues on the LUSD you. Board. I've met with several of them individually. Um, I'm very encouraged by mm -hmm. your outlook, your passion, your determination, your experience to synthesize it all into forward momentum for our kids. Thank it's you. great to hear and see, and you know we have a long collaboration going back 14 years. You know, oh. so it's it's terrific. Um, and I also want to commend you for the way you handled the December 15th um, tragedy. Uh, there was was some second guessing on it, but I think you handled it beautifully, Thank and you. I want to just be on the record for that. Thank you. I think the city family did exactly what it needed to do. Um, and you, your leadership on that day was uh, ex exceptional, so I'm going to thank you for that. Thank you. Um, and interestingly enough, I, I also focus on joint use, and you and I have talked about this. I think, yeah. I think most of your colleagues, maybe all of them, and even Superintendent King, uh, have a similar philosophy that schools are our neighborhood centers, mm -hmm. and we want to open them up. And right. So one que uh, question, is the board... Are you currently re-examining your joint use agreement policy? No. I know the attorneys for LASD are much more critical of, of the joint gentle use word program. What's that? The gentle. That's a gentle term. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I've sat in some of those meetings where four or five attorneys are sitting there saying, "No, oh, you can't do this. You can't do that. You can't do that." In fact, we're going to decrease the contracts to ten years or less, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I'm I'm hoping that um, we can expand joint yep. use agreement programs and I think you have a very willing city council uh, to to be committed to that effort I, I, I agree with you councilman and and let me let me explain it it's easy for me to take um, you know shots at the, at the, at the lawyers um, and uh, I, I you know because I, I mean I, I you know we were organizers and it, it, it's you know we don't like to be told no when we're when we're doing things on 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 behalf of, of, of kids, but let let me say what we've got to figure out. What we what we've got to figure out is um, it, we have to figure out liability issues, and those are real. I mean, for they don't feel real to me. What feels real to me is I see a padlock on a elementary school. I see a playground mm -hmm. there and play equipment, and I see kids playing in the street. That's what feels real to me. And um, we we do um, we we do pay folks, good folks, to make sure that that I, that my passion and energy around this um, has some guardrails. And the guardrails involve liability. And 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 look, 
I believe, and this is why I tell them all the time, this can be figured out. Agreed. This is not, you know, this, this, this is actually not rocket science, and we can, we can get to opening up those gates and not having people kind of lose their minds. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I do, you and I, you and I work to open a skate park in Elysian Valley. And then we worked to open one at LeConte in, in Hollywood. And it only took 10 years oh. <laughs> you know, to just get... One, just we're, one child. We're, right. So, so <laughs> but, but it, was, it, was, it, it took that dogged determination. And I feel like what we do, but we got them open. Right. And so what I feel that we've got to do is it's got to be that collective determination to say, you know what, we're going to do this throughout the city. It's going to be big and we're going to figure it out because we can't, it's just morally unacceptable to have a play facility, kids looking through a fence at a play facility and being forced to play in the street. It's right. just it's just not okay. Well said. And in closing for me, it's heartbreaking because when I was a kid, I went to public schools. Um, public schools didn't have fences around them then. Mm -hmm. You could just go into the schoolyard on the weekends or after school and continue playing in the field yeah. or whatever it may be. And, right. and I, it, it, I'm heart sick that young kids these days just don't have that same freedom yep. that my generation had. So yep. I know it's a, a bygone era, but I, yep. I think we can figure it we out. Can. And I think it be, can be very closely regulated as well. Yep. And that's what our attorneys are always Absolutely. concerned about. But I think we can figure out too. So we I love your perspective happen. and your, your attitude on we can, this. We can make it happen. Let me add one last thing. Lynn Andrews, principal of Alessandro Elementary School, retired this year after 34 years. You and I both served under him, I would say. He opened up his school all the time to kids in the neighborhood. When they were in high school, when they were in middle school, he said, as long as you behave here, this school is a safe haven for you. And nothing ever happened right. on that campus. 34 years, nothing ever happened on that campus. So, the, you know, in honor of Lynn Andrews, I know we, we can make that happen. He's thank a you. good man. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you for, um, David, for bringing President Zimmer before the committee. Uh, President Zimmer, thank you for taking the time and for your presentation and, and for your passion to serve our students uh, here at the LA Unified School District. I, for one, uh, value uh, public education as a product of LA Unified School District attending Dana, uh, Leland Street, Dana, and San Peter High School. I also value my relationship with our school board member, Dr. Vladovic, who's been a champion for us. Um, and I want to recognize you and your school board for bringing in um, Michelle King. Uh, it was this committee uh, that uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Chairman Rue brought um, the um, search team um, to seek a, a, a superintendent that understands a school district well, who, uh, who knows a school district and is passionate about serving the students first, putting all politics aside. And that decision that you and your board made is the right decision that Thank was you. made. So we appreciate Thank you. bringing um, Superintendent King to lead um, the school district to the next level. And your comments on um, the joint use agreements, I mean, as you know, the, this, this council, this committee uh, shares the importance uh, and the commitment to ensure that we um, put, put the attorneys together and try to figure this out. And I know the importance of you know, after school programs as a police officer. And I, for one, uh, took advantage of summer programs at school sites. Um, I shared with this with um, a number of individuals in this committee. Uh, my mom would pack me a lunch. I would just walk down the street to Leland Street Elementary School and we'd have a grand old time. And I wasn't out in the street causing problems. So um, I'm hoping that we can collectively work together uh, to, to get this agreement uh, move, move forward. Um, I have also understand the importance of ensuring that we don't lose students to other school districts and, and other uh, private schools. Um, and I feel that the school district's commitment to magnets is going to keep students in those, in those schools and those chairs. And, um, I, I want to uh, recognize Dr. Vladovic's leadership mm -hmm. for identifying a number of magnet schools, naming new magnet schools both in Wilmington and San Pedro. Um, and my son's benefiting from one of the newest steam magnets at Dana Middle School, and it's, it's just taken off. And the partnerships with the Port of Los Angeles and a number of community-based organizations like the Cabrillo, uh, Cabrillo Aquarium is alive and well. Um, 
so thank you for your leadership on, on creating more magnets and ensuring that we don't lose students to other school districts. Thank you. The um, restorative justice. I want to get your, 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 your thoughts on restorative justice. I know uh, a few years back, um, this council supported the school district's um, efforts and, and movement in ensuring that we don't just suspend students. Mm -hmm. um, I have found in some of the, um, you know, my student, my, my, both of my kids are, are attending LA Unified School Districts. And I get, oftentimes, I get text messages and calls from parents um, who are frustrated with the restorative justice system where, you know, you have a, a child who is, you know, is violent in school and is not suspended and is mm -hmm. welcomed back the following day. So, uh, in which I, you know, I support, I just have to explain to the, uh, the parents who are complaining that, you know, would you rather have them a home alone at home or, you know, or with a insurer, you know, work, who has a maybe single, a single parent who has to take time out of, out of work. But it, it, it's just a balancing act. How, how are you in the school board um, addressing those issues? And Mr. Zimmer, I'm sorry, can you answer it in a minute? We're, we're, gonna be we're, we're on time. Uh, so let, 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 me, let me say first, thank you for recognizing Dr. V. Amazing, um, the model is Dana and other, other school, magnet schools in, in, in his district. This is, uh, this is a delicate balancing act. Uh, and as, as often happens when you have statistics that make you want to turn away in shame, which our suspension and expulsion rates did, right. um, sometimes there, there's a very aggressive swing. And uh, I'm a great believer in restorative practices. I use them as a teacher. I use them as a counselor. These are not things that you can develop overnight. It has to do with really creating a full school supportive culture so that you should never have to get one of those text messages because everybody at the school would know what is the procedure, what is kind of the embrace of support that comes around the student who is acting out, but also protects other children from that behavior until we can get that behavior out of control. The idea is not that there are no consequences. The idea is not that there are, that, that there are no actions. The idea is just that the act of suspending was number one, disproportionately targeted at African American and Latino young men. Mm -hmm. but, but number two, and in some ways almost as important, is it wasn't working. So what we need to do, just three things very, very quickly. We have to start with social emotional learning at a very young age. We have to start with teaching empathy to our kids at, in elementary school. Number, the, the, that's the first thing. The second thing is, is that we have to have a full community education around restorative practices that are not, that's a buzzword. It is really about creating supportive school communities for all kids. Mm -hmm. And the third thing is, is to help families explain, explain what restorative practice is and what restorative practice isn't. Truly violent behaviors and antisocial act, acting out is, has consequences that are beyond the restorative practice system. And we have to clearly differentiate, make sure all of our folks are trained, but also communicate much better because I believe that as parents and family members, this is a system that we would support if we can, it, it, if we can perfect it, but also communicate it much better. So I appreciate Thank the Thank you, question. Steve. I Thanks. appreciate you being here. And then lastly, if I know we have to get to council, but we do need to recognize the hard work that teachers do day in and day out. Absolutely. I'm married to one, two of my sisters are teachers for LA Unified, and we have tons of friends. So thank you for supporting our teachers in the classroom as well. And the makeup of the board yeah. is incredible today because folks like yourself, the board members like yourself, have been in the classroom, have been on campus, you're not in here for, you're not in this seat for political reasons. You're here for the best interest of our kids. So really Thank appreciate you. your commitment. We salute our teachers. We salute all of our employees. And again, it is, it is, it's an honor to be here. Please welcome us back. We, yeah, we, thank we you, will be glad to come. Next right. time, next thank time you. we'll pick a topic. Okay. <laughs> and then we'll just have to focus <laughs> on that topic. Thank you. And, and, you know, when this committee was formed, Council President Weston challenged um, personally myself on education. So we're going to be continuing this. Thank you for that. Um, we do have uh, uh, com the reappointment of Commissioner Robert Pitonte in the audience. Um, all, uh, colleagues, we all have his resume. He is more than well qualified. I don't know how all his degrees fit in one business card. Unless Move anyone approval. has questions, okay. We, I'd like to take two and items number two and three, which are both reappointments on consent. But on that note, 
for items four, five, and six. If you guys don't have a problem, I'd like to take that also on consent. Do it. Have approval. So if we could go move two through six on consent. Mm -hmm. So move. Thank you, and this meeting is adjourned, and let's get downstairs. Thank you.